I'm going to share my screen again. This is your guys' opportunity to see how terrible I am with technology. Um, now let me see here. Slideshow. Okay, is it there? Um, okay, so it's there. Yay! Uh, Dr. Panero and I picked this because it's yellow and it, we thought it was really cheerful. Um, okay, so we have a lot to talk about and I'm going to try to have time at the end for actual conversation and because I would like to hear from all of you. Um, but I want to just start by saying, um, kind of going back to Brian's presentation on, um, you know, kind of operational sustainability, productivity. Um, you guys all got to have a taste of how fun finance is. Um, I think what I, the message I want more than anything for all of you to have walking out of, or I guess signing off of this meeting, is that we need to make a shift in how we're doing things so that people can get back to spending time with consumers and doing it in a way where we can see results positive outcomes for consumers, and we can meet the requirements that we have to show that we're doing the job that we're tasked to do. And that's not a simple task, but it's a doable task. And I think if you went back and talked to any of your staff, you would hear them, you know, if you asked them, they would say they did not come into this field because they wanted to be sitting at computers typing on, you know, typing on them and writing up progress notes and things like that. They went into this because they wanted to spend time helping people. And we have gone very far, and, and I don't mean we as an agency, I mean as a field, we've gone very far towards um, being very focused on data and you know task-oriented things and missing the whole purpose, which is to spend time with people. But when you look at data like Brian showed, we have an agency-wide problem, right? This isn't a couple of people here and a couple of people there. This is a problem agency-wide in how we are structured to provide services and what emphasis we've had. And so we want to talk about team-based care today. And the context is we need to make some changes in how we're providing our services so that we're meeting the needs of the consumers and we're meeting the needs of our staff. Because it's not a fulfilling job to spend sitting at the computer typing. It's a fulfilling job when you get to work with people that you went to school to be able to do. And that's a really important piece to keep in mind. This is not going to be an easy thing. It's going to be, there, it's going to get messy. There's going to be screw ups. We're going to have things that we have to fix. And we all have to go into it with that mindset because we will not be successful if we don't realize that going in. But what we do know is that there is mountain, there are mountains of research showing team-based care being effective, not just for our patients, but for staff. And we really feel strongly that this is the direction that we need to go. Us as an agency, but behavioral health as a system is all moving in this direction for that very reason. We're just kind of slow about doing it in the behavioral health system. So I'm gonna let Dr. Panero kind of talk about, I know we've had some presentations on this before, but I think it's good to just kind of revisit some of the key pieces of team-based care so we can get into sort of the what's, why's, and how's of, of our internal process. Okay, so hopefully everyone can hear me okay. <clears throat> if you can't, let me know. Um, as we all know, team-based care is the provision of comprehensive health care by a group of professionals, so at least two providers who work collaborative with the patient and their significant others in a person-centered manner to accomplish the shared goals that the consumer has and to achieve the coordinated high-quality care. So that's care that's safe and effective, like Julie talked about. It's efficient, it's timely, and it's equitable. So as a group of professionals, and this slide is taken from primary care, so you have the PCP in there, you know, the primary care health provider, a behavioral health specialist, social work, nutritionist, peer. Our teams will be different with our professionals, so 
you know, therapy, case management, uh, peer support, excuse me, as well as nursing, psychiatry, and perhaps, you know, other staff as appropriate. And the team is interdisciplinary, and that's extremely important. That means the team follows certain guidelines. So within the team, there's very clear, specified roles. That builds dependability and accountability. We know who's going to do what when. But the roles are also supported by each other. So for example, when I was in a DBT team-based care uh, team a uh, long time ago, I knew when, you know, which skills a consumer was working on. So when they came to me because of the team, uh, when they came to me and they asked for medication change for uh, emotional dysregulation when the medication change was not appropriate, we could talk about the skills and I could support the therapist and the consumer was hearing the same thing from all the providers and we had outstanding outcomes. Um, there's mutual trust. Um, we're going to talk about that quite a bit. Um, another term for that is psychological safety. There's effective communication. So communication that supports what we call environmental uh, awareness. So we can respond rapidly when there's a change in the consumer presentation. And also communication that supports education within the team. Um, so another term for it is a culture of curiosity. So we're frequently educating each other. Um, some of the training is done in a team format. If individual staff go out to a conference, they bring the information back to the team, educate the rest of the team on how are we going to incorporate this new information in the field. And you have a shared goal with measurable processes and outcomes. Next slide. So it's an interdisciplinary team. It's different from a multidisciplinary team. We're all familiar with the multidisciplinary team, where you also have different professionals who are interacting with the person being served. They each evaluate the consumer independently and write their own report. There's no set forum in where discussion of the different evaluations can be had and kind of incorporated so all the staff know all the information. Um, and each staff, you know, even though one staff may do a person-centered plan, all the other staff also have goals for the consumer that they've discussed with the consumer in a person-centered plan, uh, in a person-centered way, but those, there's no way to incorporate that into the major plan. And the communication is mainly done through the EMR, so through progress notes, uh, perhaps consult notes. So that's the difference of where we were way back and where we're headed. Next slide. So, you know, as a group of professionals um, working together for a common purpose, so one of the purposes is the patient-focused care for an individual consumer. The other common goal is the collaborative ownership of the team's panel, consumer panel. So that's significantly different and it's moving away from, this is not my consumer. So I don't need to attend the meeting today because my consumer is not gonna be discussed. Or um, they're talking about somebody I don't know, so maybe I should check emails because I'm expecting a really important email. There's, there's ownership by all the staff of the team panel. And once we talk about this, it raises a lot of questions, um, which we'll be touching on. As you can see, it requires a significant change in structure, as well as our mental set. And Julie is going to be talking about all the steps that we're going to be taking in order to accomplish this. Next slide. 
So why move to team-based care? Well, it's the standard of care. It's also the standard of practice uh, throughout many industries from Google avia aviation to um, high level management in very a very um, variety of corporations, as well as in healthcare. Uh, it's not a new concept. Back in 1960 uh, or thereabouts, the American Academy of Pe Pediatrics kind of set forth the, the concept of interdisciplinary teams. Uh, when they were struggling with how to take care of children who are facing all the issues with chronic conditions. Um, in the 1970s, um, Stein and Fest uh, developed ACT, which is an interdisciplinary team, to take care of people with serious mental illness as they were transitioning from the state hospitals to the community. Team-based care has taken off in the primary care world. And you can see there the NCQA now requires team-based care to be certified as a patient-centered health home. Um, it has progressed to subspecialty care. So some um, cardiology practices, um, uh, even obstetric practices are developing team-based care. And in the behavioral health field, it has become known, so if you look at the quote on the right-hand side, as the gold standard for cares of patients suffering with mental illness. But why do we need it? Um, and our patients are very complex. They're very challenging. They require all of our expertise. And they require us to interface with lots of agencies outside of our agency. On top of that, we now have integrated care, which adds another layer of complexity. Um, we have all this data we need to collect, you know, the HEDIS measures, and you know, everybody wants data that we need to enter. And it has become impossible for a single person or group of professionals working in parallel to accomplish everything that needs to be it needs to be done. So like Julie talked about, people are spending lots of time on the computer rather than seeing consumers. And as this leads to significant burnout and, uh, and staff turnover. Next slide. So does it work? It's an extremely important question. Um, and there has been lots and lots of research to show that you get um, disease-specific improvement with team-based care. So hypertension, diabetes, um, you have decreased emergency room hospitalization, you have decreased medical hospitalization, you have decreased psychiatric hospitalization, uh, you have increased capacity and access. Um, we have decreased mortality rates. And in the behavioral health space, um, there's a decreased suicide, increased adherence to taking medications. And in the substance abuse side, there's an increased um, incidence of being able to maintain abstinence. The one caveat though, is that the research has also shown that the positive outcomes are dependent on how well the team adheres to the principles of team-based care. So this is not unexpected for us. You know, we know evidence-based care or evidence-based practices and how important it is to adhere to the, the foundations of the practice. Um, and they have found that um, a couple of things are really important um, to show outcomes, and it's the team's ability to team, um, or the other thing that the research talks about is kind of the adaptive reserve of the team. So to explain that, it's, you know, you could have teams that function well day to day, 
but the adaptive reserve or the ability to team occurs in, in those days where everything goes wrong. We've had those where things are very chaotic, where situations are rapidly changing and uncertain. Does the team fall apart? Does the team just bear through it and survive? Or does the team really, really come together and are they able to be creative and innovative under that additional stress? And it's those types of teams that can have the significant improved outcome. Um, another example that's been given, um, it's not in the behavioral health space, but is by Amy uh, Edmondson from Harvard. If you haven't watched her YouTube, you may want to do that. Um, she talked about the um, mining uh, disaster that happened in Chile about 10 years ago, where a group of miners after a mining accident were trapped below over 2,000 feet of solid rock. And what the Chile government did was very interesting. They developed a team that had governmental officials, mining experts, but they brought in people from NASA, they brought in people from the Navy, they brought in a whole bunch of experts that really worked together with a common goal to take these miners out. They had lots and lots of setbacks, but they were able to work together to overcome them. So they weren't just submitting reports, they weren't just working in isolation, they were working together. Next slide. So Google was very interested in this as well. You know, what were the five things that led, that caused the team to be successful? So they did a whole bunch of research in this. And they were very surprised with the outcomes. So the number one criteria um, that a team had to have in order to be successful is what they called psychological safety. It's the ability of the staff to feel safe within the team to take risks and to be vulnerable in front of each other. And that is essential for creativity. The second one was that dependability. Can I depend on my teammates um, as we care for this consumer and this group of teams? Third, so it's down the line after one and two, is the structure and the clarity of the goals. And the National Council has found the same thing. So agencies that really focus on structure, how are we gonna organize, how we, you know, focus on the organizational part of it and don't focus enough on the basics of how the teams interact and function, they don't do as well. They don't have the outcomes. And then the fourth and the fifth are really personal, which to me relates to psychological safety. Is what I do, does it have personal meaning and do I feel like I have an impact? If I don't have psychological safety, those things are not gonna be there. Next slide. So what is psychological safety? So all of us are learned very young, especially by the time we get to school about how to keep ourselves safe. So oftentimes we don't wanna appear uninformed. So we may not ask questions because we don't wanna see like, you know, the only person who doesn't know something, but that gets in a very vicious cycle where if you don't ask the questions, you will be uninformed. And there isn't that interferes with that situational awareness uh, that the team needs to have. We don't want to be incompetent, so we don't talk about our mistakes. And this is extremely important because mistakes are often due to some kind of process error. And unless we talk about our mistakes, the team can't help fix it, so it will happen again. We don't want to offer ideas because we're being intrusive, or that we don't want to, you know, challenge something because we don't want to be negative. So psychological safety is providing an environment where people feel comfortable 
asking questions. The team talks about their mistakes um, and everybody's free to offer ideas. All right, ready for me to jump in? Yep. I just wanted to make a comment. If um, those of you who are trained in DBT, you might see some you know, similarities. I think, you know, I know when I joined a DBT team, that was one of the first things was really setting out a no judgment zone and being able to be, you know, really share vulnerabilities with challenging cases and getting ideas and things like that. So just like for, con you know, context. So five components of effective interdisciplinary teams, um, and I'm going to go into these in more detail in the, in the subsequent slides, but um, they are, they have established open, safe communication patterns. They have well-defined and appropriate team goals, clear role definitions and expectations for team members. This is really important because, well, I'll get into it later. <laughs> um, a real-time structured yet flexible decision-making process and the ability of the team to um, quote unquote treat itself by celebrating accomplishments and addressing breakdowns. I think that's something that we miss a lot is even though we have those opportunities there, like in every staff meeting, say, you know, any successes or recognition, it gets easy to start to overlook that and maybe not mention things that have happened. And I think that's really important for teams to, you know, constantly be aware of even those little successes that make everything worth it. So establishment of open communication patterns. Um, I gotta move this, okay. So um, this is really important that the teams decide um, how often they wanna have team meetings, what kind of common language they want to use. Um, you know, this is one of the things about an interdisciplinary team is you'll have different um, types of people, like you might have a therapist, a nurse, a case manager, and they all might talk about something a little differently. And so having a common language is really key for making sure everybody understands the same things. Um, and just establishing consistent protocols, procedures for how the team is going to function. Having regular contact with leadership, um, just to make sure that the team is on par with meeting performance expectations that sort of keep us sustainable. You know, again, referencing back to Brian's um, presentation a little earlier. Um, it's important that the teams have a shared vision and shared goals and that they review them regularly to make sure that they're still on point with those things. Um, maintaining regular um, group and one-on-one -on -one supervision is also really key. Um, making sure that the supervisors have the time to be able to dedicate to working with all of the individuals on the team is really key. And then again, and um, Dr. Pinero mentioned this earlier, maintaining fidelity to evidence-based practice. So this isn't like a, we're gonna do team-based care, forget evidence-based practices. This is how can we enhance the use of evidence-based practices and hopefully be able to open up resources or use them differently in a way that allows us to have better adherence. Um, Define appropriate team goals. So, um, Developing a team dashboard that includes measurable and meaningful relevant goals. So that's something that um, leadership is already working on and, and there are is already a dashboard, but I think incorporating some of these other performance metrics into it so that it's something that the team can refer back to and use as a resource to make sure that um, what they're trying to accomplish is something that can be accomplished and that they can reflect that they've accomplished it. Um, so, and, you know, just having that relate to the broader organizational goals, you know, we have certain expectations that we have to meet from outside parties. And so this really is a matter of how do we hand these goals down to the teams and give them the opportunity to determine, okay, we need to meet these expectations. How as a team do we want to go about making that happen? Um, I could go on, I guess, you know, I, I think I've covered this pretty much. So this really should stay at the forefront in your team meetings. It should be part of the conversations regularly, making sure that, um, that, that every member of the team is maintaining awareness of these goals. Um, clear role expectations for team members. Um, this is a really, really important um, piece because 
when there's a lot of misconception about who's responsible for what. And so it's easy to say, well, I don't do that. Like, I'm sure right now you guys can think of tons of examples of like where a case manager is doing something and a peer support might be doing something very similar and the outpatient therapist might be also doing that. And it's unclear who is responsible. Uh, additionally, it, that becomes a really inefficient way of being able to actually accomplish the work that needs to be done. So making sure that it's really clear on the team who is responsible for what, and that might be per team meeting, okay, this is what I can do, this is what you can do, this is what you can do based on your role, your job, your license, your degree, and who's going to follow up on these certain things, similar to how ACT team works, right? So they have this shared purpose, and then they kind of divide the labor, but they do that in the context of understanding what each person on the team is able to do through their training, licensure, degree, and so on and so forth. Um, if there's any um, disagreement about that, or if anything is unclear, if there's any conflict around that, it has to be addressed, and it has to be addressed immediately, or else you run into the, you know, like an, a poor performing team because there's a lack of good communication. This starts a breakdown. Um, and so, um, it, having that shared ownership over your over your team is the most effective way of making sure that you have that ability to share responsibilities across the team as as you can do um, flexible decision making process well you have to have a decision making process first of all um, if you're in a team that doesn't have a decision making process it's going to become really challenging and so um, sometimes it might be that you know there is a leadership decision that has to take place so the supervisor just has to say okay this is how it's going to be but um, there are other times where the team needs to decide together or there needs to be a way of agreeing okay this is how we're going to do you know new case referrals and this is how we're going to do first services and you know some of those kind of task oriented things and then on top of it um, also how are we going to assure and I'll talk about this again, um, things like being able to depend on each other, being able to share those vulnerabilities, being able to um, assure psychological safety. You know, everybody has to take that same ownership um, in order for those things to actually work. So um, taking into consideration um, on how you wanna do this is, um, who is going to, who has the information necessary and who is responsible for the implementation of whatever the decision is. That needs to be taken into consideration in how you're going to take this, how you're going to do the work. And this is really what, and, and Dr. Panero mentioned the word teaming earlier, this is what really teaming looks like. Okay, we've got this really co complex situation. We see it a little bit in the CRCT reviews. Okay. This is what's going on. These are the things that need to be followed up on. Who's going to do each of those things and how are we gonna come back and share that information to make sure that everybody is on the same page? Um, so there's lots of different ways that we can do this. And just for sake of time, I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on these, but these are just some examples of, of how decisions can be made. These are things that the team will have to decide. We're not going to set up teams and say, you're going to operate exactly like this because teams need to be different based on what counties they're in, what populations they're serving, what resources are available. So we will have high level decisions made about um, what the team outcomes need to be. But the decision-making process, for example, really needs to come from how the team itself wants to operate and what will work best for them. Um, and then lastly, the ability of the team to treat itself. Um, there are some resources that we have that we'll be sharing as we roll this out. Um, a team self audit, um, that is an opportunity to review the dashboard. Um, how are we doing? You know, our, basically a self assessment of, you know, how is the team performing in the way that they want to be? And then um, very much encouraging, you know, idea sharing, suggestions, you know, taking input from the people that are doing the work. This is one of the greatest opportunities for really true um, quality improvement from the bottom up. Um, 
letting individuals on the team have opportunities to take leadership that you know there are lots of people that might want to have a leadership role or to develop their leadership skills and being in teams like this gives more opportunity to be able to do that and then very importantly the team has to have a protocol on how they will support each other um, whether you know it, whether it's something that happened at work or whether they're you know they're just having a hard time because of something happened on their personal life that might be impacting you know them at work those are all things that um, the team needs to be able to decide how are we going to make sure that we we're addressing this you know one of the jokes i always say is um when i was a case manager we used to like talk each other through cockroach infestations like oh i just went to a consumer's house and there were cockroaches and oh my gosh you know we'd be like okay this is what you're gonna do you're gonna when you get home you're gonna like take your shoes off you're gonna just put them in the trash you're gonna burn your you know and it was kind of joking but it was also a great way to be like oh you know kind of just get get some of those things out so uh, components of team-based care so you have structure and then you have process. And we're going to be really looking at both of those things. So the structure is just basically like, this is what the team looks like. This is who's on the team. This is what they do on the team. This is what their dashboard has, you know, all of those kinds of things. Caseload size, you know, performance metrics. Process is much more, you know, what is the team vision for itself? What are the goals for the team? Um, how do they want to um, do their decision making? how are they going to communicate and assure the psychological uh, safety so those kinds of things so um, we always have to keep that in mind that structure and process are two separate things but are both very important in having a successful team so um the team is here vision and i guess i should be checking dr panera just jump in if i'm supposed to uh, have you talking <laughs> oh yeah <laughs> um so the vision for for us as an agency is that we would like to reorganize into teams in each of our six counties and the team composition while i don't have it exactly yet because that's part of the process that we need to go through is that the team will truly be um, interdisciplinary and will have you know prescribe uh, psychiatry nurse peer outpatient case management all making up the team together. Everybody that I listed brings a special set of skills that can really enhance, you know, working together and and help with working with consumers. Um, we intend to shift to a higher um, emphasis on case management for consumers. I don't think that's news to anybody in this room. I have certainly talked about it enough, um, but we've put a lot of people in outpatient who are not ready for outpatient and are really getting sort of a blend of case management and outpatient because you can only do so much when your caseload is very high in outpatient and you've got people who are really not ready for therapy. And unfortunately what's happened is we have a lot of consumers that don't have a clear understanding of what therapy really is because we're not able to truly adhere to therapy in many of those circumstances. Um, so we, are going to be changing the case manager role. You know, Brian showed some numbers earlier. Um, our performance metrics for productivity with case managers is, you know, on the low end of 25%. We're not hitting that target. So it might be like, what are you thinking? However, um, we can expect case managers to do something differently if we don't tell them what it is that we want them to do. So we have a team of case management supervisors, program directors, peer support, um, nursing really looking at the case manager role and what it has been what it kind of evolved into and where we want to take it um, that's going to be really important for the success of team-based care in my mind because then we can use therapy really for what it is intended to be which is for people who are action oriented have a specific goal in mind for therapy and are ready to engage it and the therapist can see them regularly like weekly as therapy typically should be um, and the case managers, um, it breaks my heart because I hear this too often, where case managers don't feel clinical. Well, I'm not clinical. And I think we've um, unintentionally given them that message because we've put such an emphasis on clinicians or therapists. But case managers are clinicians. They are clinical. They, did, they went to school for this. There's a lot of clinical components to what they do. 
and I don't know that they feel the freedom to do that. And so we need to make it really clear what it is that we want them to do and give them that, that freedom to use the clinical skills that they have to really work with individuals and get them ready for therapy if that's what they need or, or whatever else it might be that the consumer would benefit from. So each team will be led by a supervisor. Um, and as we talked about, the team will have shared caseload and tasks. Now, this is still person-centered, so I wanna keep that in mind. Like if you know I'm a consumer and I'm like, I'm not seeing anybody but my case manager, you know, John, sorry, John, you're at the top of my screen. <laughs> then we need, to, we need to work with that, right? We're not gonna say, okay, well, you don't get to see John. But what is great about team-based care is that um, if I am you know, not doing well and John goes on vacation, there's a whole group of people that know me and know that they you know, might know what I need and I don't have to start over with a new story. So we can support each other that way as well. Um, shared decision-making, as we mentioned, and this is going to really require a lot of energy and effort on the parts of the teams to come up with the strategy that they wanna to use to do that. And really a lot of team autonomy on developing their own internal workflows and processes. We want to give the teams as much ability as we can to decide how they're going to accomplish the overall agency targets that we have set. Before I move on, does any reactions to what we've talked about so far or what this vision is? I can't see many of you, so. Yeah, neither can I. Um, all right, so feel free to jump in at any point. Why are we doing this? I think we, you know, we've talked about this a little bit, but I want to um, just go through a few things. So uh, Dr. Panero said earlier, um, no, it's come to a point where no one person really can manage all of the things that are expected of them without complete burnout or stress. It's really challenging. And we don't want people to be out on you know, limbs by themselves. And it's one of the things that we talked about with CRCT also, we don't want people to have to make really tough decisions and not have the support that they need to implement those decisions. Um, we need our caseholders to have more support. They need it. They've made that very clear and we know it. This is a really high stress job. When you look up most stressful jobs in the world, social work is frequently on that list. And we are doing a disservice to ourselves and our staff if we don't always keep this in the forefront of what we're doing. And I think we have done that to a degree, but I think we can do better. And this is a way to do that better. We know by research that team-based care results in better outcomes for consumers. And at the end of the day, that is the most important thing because that is what we are expected to do. We also know that team-based care results in better job satisfaction, which is also very important. And we also know when you have better job satisfaction, you have better retention and better results for consumers because they keep the same people that they've been working with. Um, you also end up with things like more creativity to deal with difficult problems. Um, you have the ability to really tap into different expertise and skill sets. You know, we were talking about this in some of our subgroups. You know, there might be a person or two on each team that just knows how to write have support waiver plans. Like they, and we have some of those people in the agency. They never miss them. They get them, they submit them, they're always accepted. That's a skill set that could be tapped into on teams so they don't have to redo their work. Oh, sorry, mission um, denied this one. You gotta go back and write it like this or add this in. Mm -hmm. Why not tap into a skill set that you have on the team so that you don't have to re redo your work? Um, we also know that service delivery becomes a lot more efficient. Um, communication, Im improved communication helps a lot with that because you're not replicating work or duplicating things. And you know up front, sometimes it's like, well, I gotta go back and let me talk to this person. You have the ability to, in those team meetings to really discuss these different situations and know in advance what are some of the options that you have to work with. Um, the uh, approach of team-based care resulting in good consumer outcomes helps us stay very relevant and competitive in the behavioral health care world. And I can't like overstate that because there are changes coming. We don't know what they're going to be. 
But we do know that the behavioral health world is moving to this. And if we wanna stay at the forefront of, of services and service delivery, this becomes more important. We want to be able to do this for a really long time. And the last thing I wanted to just uh, mention, and I've got some comments referenced in my notes, um, we did ELT visits and got staff feedback. Um, we did surveys with staff on strategic planning, and we heard loud and clear, staff want more support, they want more efficiency. Um, some of the feedback that they talked about was caseloads being high, staff burn burnout, staff turnover, um, you know, that um, there were staff that wanted to take on more leadership roles, um, that they felt like there should be more monitoring of job satisfaction, sec secondary trauma, retention, that they wanted a more focus on strengths, um, and that they see when we talk, when we, in the strategic planning survey, one of the questions was, what are some of the strengths that we have? And team, coworkers, collaboration, supporting each other, and working well together were all common themes listed. So this really sets us up to be able to get at all of the things that the staff already see as huge strengths of an organization. So um, the other thing is that um, some of the suggestions that came out of that survey were things like wanting more clinical su supervision, wanting flexibility in caseloads, wanting changes in productivity standards, more training and more team building opportunities. So these are all things that become really important um, in team-based care. So um, just being mindful of time, I'm gonna jump through these next slides pretty quickly so we can get to the end. Um, so how are we doing this? We have one big committee of team-based care and underneath that committee, we have two subgroups, one focusing on the case manager role um, and one focusing on team-based care implementation. So in the case manager role, the other thing I wanna mention is that they're also looking at levels of care. So one of the things that we'd like to change is um, being able to look at what a consumer's needs are and, uh, uh, and targeting the services and service frequency based on what their, um, what their actual needs are. So we may have some people that don't need to be seen that frequently because they're doing pretty well, but we need to keep them open. So they may be seen less frequently. Then we might have other people that need you know, they've just come out of the hospital, they might need to be seen once or twice a week. And so having the ability to match level of care, going back to what Liz talked about in, in terms of a crosswalk between the locus and the DLA-20, it really gives us that ability to have like that dynamic, you know, that shifting between levels of care within the team. Um, so each team has to come up with a work plan, okay? And so I'm gonna, I will gladly share these. I can send them out to the group afterwards um, just so I can move through these fairly quickly. But um, the case management work plan is going to focus on um, providing staff training on roles and responsibilities of case management. They're going to focus on creating levels of care and intensity of service. So it might be like a ranking of a consumer. They're a one through a four, and if they're a four, they need to be seen this frequently if there are one this frequently and everything in between. Um, they're also going to implement the use of the outcome measurement tool. So that would be the DLA 20. Um, they will be evaluating staffing resources. I know that will be a question. Probably many of you are thinking it. Many of you have already asked it in these work, um, these work groups. So we're going to need to look at what resources do we have now and where do we need them to be. And then Choosing the administrative targets for service delivery. An example is productivity, but there are lots of other, um, other areas that we'll have to look at for service delivery and what performance metrics do we need to have in place. And then lastly, they'll be looking at updating any policies, procedures, and guidelines that need to be um, updated to fit with what we're doing in this change. The team-based care implementation work plan um, first and foremost is defining team-based care for CMH, CM, because it doesn't look exactly the same in every place. Um, then it'll be actually organizing into the teams. And then um, really the goal coming after that would be the improved staff and team performance. So that will be, and this will be working in tandem with the other group on those kind of those team targets. So um, you know, there will be some crossover between those two areas. 
um, determining training gaps and needs for staff and supervisors. You're going to need a lot of training on what this looks like, what to expect, how to be prepared for it. And then um, the teams will really take on defining and creating the internal processes. And I think it, that will have to be done with support of the work groups to make sure that you know, they're hitting all the areas that um, need to be addressed. Um, I have a communication plan. Um, I spent a ridiculous amount of time trying to paste it into this PowerPoint and I gave up. So these are just the headers. And again, I can share this with the group if you like. Um, Updating the charter to make it a little bit more specific needs to happen. Um, super management kickoff, that's this now. Um, we will be reviewing this progress monthly in COC. Um, I plan on sending out a monthly kind of all staff report on updates and progress. Um, I'll be doing a presentation to our board services committee. Um, we are going to be having some staff focus groups and that's what I'm gonna talk about next. And then we'll have some marketing tools and um, a program evaluation for annual reporting. So focus groups. Um, we really would like to have input from staff as much as possible. Um, obviously, I can't put every staff person on a work group. Um, as it is, my, my big work group is really big, but um, in which is why it was split into two. But we want to make sure that we're addressing all of the concerns, the potential barriers, and that we're continuing practices that staff feel like are working. And so we want to hear from staff. And I would like to hear from you guys on some of these things. So we, this is sort of the plan right now is that we'll have six focus groups. We're gonna have to do them by Zoom. Um, and we want staff to give input on the following areas, the case management changes, levels of care and team-based care. And I have a lot of questions. Don't be shocked when you see them. I don't know that we're gonna be able to use them all but just to give you a sense of some of the things that we wanna get at from staff. And if any of you have ideas on other ways that we might wanna get at this besides focus groups, please share that with us because we definitely want feedback. I know we have a lot of the supervisors on these teams, but primarily it's the case management supervisors. So I wanna hear from the other ones as well. So these are some of the things we wanna get at around case management. Um, how, do you describe, how would you describe the role? Um, how do you think it could be improved? How would you improve face-to-face -face services? How would you increase face-to-face -face time? What are some things that you're not doing face-to-face -face but could be? And what are some things that you're doing that are repetitive or duplicated or could be done by another staff person? Like, is there something that you're doing as a case manager that could be done by a nurse? Or is there something a nurse is doing that could be done by a case manager? Or maybe a peer support? Are we tapping into all the resources that we have to the full ability that we, we could be? Under levels of care, um, how would you see moving consumers um, to higher and lower levels of care within a team? And um, what ideas or visions would you have for um, what services we could offer to consumers who need the lowest level of care within a team? That was one of the big things that we heard a lot about in our last ELT visits was you know, you got these people sitting on your caseload that don't need very much, so you don't see them a lot, and it kind of might, um, you know, kind of drag out some of your, your stats or something like that. So we heard a lot about that, and, you know, are there ideas of what we could do for that? Um, how would you determine that somebody's ready to successfully discharge from services? And what transitional services or approach would you take to help a consumer sex successfully move to a lower level of care. And then lastly, in what ways do you see team-based care changing the way that you currently do your job? What are some team goals that would be helpful to see on a dashboard or to track to see that consumers are improving? That could be homelessness, employment, hospitalizations, jail, et cetera. Um, if there's one thing that we should avoid in implementing team-based care, what would it be? How would you approach setting up the teams to assure that they're collaborative and supportive for each member? And how can you see a team build psychological safety for all team members into the team culture? Um, I think that is something we really need to hear from everybody on because it's going to impact each person. So all that said, I really would like to hear from all of you about immediate reactions, thoughts about the questions, the focus groups, um, things that you're nervous about, things that you're excited about, 
um, we've got about 10 minutes left. So I really would, would like to hear from the supervisors or even you know, admin about um, any concerns or excitement that you have. And I'm gonna stop sharing so I can actually see people. Hi, Julie, this is Beth. I really like this idea that the way you've proposed it and the timelines. What's the timeline for the focus groups? I may have missed that part. You know, I didn't mention it, and it's in my actual communication plan that I literally could not paste into that. Page. It was a really frustrating moment for me. Um, we are hoping to do them this fall, so I'm I'm hoping like maybe uh, September-ish. Um, I want to also connect with Lori and just look at what training things we have coming up, so that I'm not um, tying up too much time for people. Um, and we really want to make sure that everybody has the opportunity to participate. So probably September maybe Thanks, into October. Peter. Thanks. Any other questions, concerns about changes that this will entail? Are you guys thinking that this might be a like for, I'm thinking productivity, would it become possibly a team productivity goal? That is absolutely a possibility. Um, actually, it's, a, it's recommended um, because you just, it may be that, you, like I said before, you might have something who's really good with like writing HAB support waiver plans. And they may wanna, we may wanna, and they may love it. I don't know who those people are, but they're probably out there. And we may want to give them more time to do that. And that's maybe less face-to-face -face time, but maybe somebody else on the team then takes on more of the face-to-face -face stuff because that's what they're really good at. Engagement is another piece. I know, I think Isabella, they, they had um, somebody work on engagement or kind of targeted, slated to work on engagement. And tapping, that's a strength that some people just really have. So they may have a higher productivity as an individual than somebody who's writing out a lot of plans. Mm -hmm. And similar to the ACT model where the productivity is really a team of productivity. Well, one of the things that we heard when um, we kind of shared this at our case management supervisor meeting was, um, is there going to be, like, I know we have all these kind of ideas and dates for, like, parts of the steps, or is there going to be, like, a, a rollout date of when, like, access people are going to be coming through and primarily getting? Um, some of us are already seeing that happen, like, where, you know, they're starting to funnel to case management because they're not yet action-oriented, and that, you know, the the structure of the staffing isn't yet fully there right. to support that level. So do you have any ideas on that? I can't say, I mean, I think it probably doesn't make the sense to say on this date, everybody goes to case management because I don't know that we're gonna be able to really do it that way. I think what we're gonna have to do is watch our resources and look at, um, you know, continually be looking at like, where do we have gaps? Like, are the caseloads starting to get high here? Do you need more case management? Um, are the outpatient um, caseloads getting lower um, that we could like not fill one and, and move it to a case management role? So I think it's gonna have to happen a little bit organically. I, I know that probably sucks to hear because it would be so much easier to just say like, it's gonna be like this and here's a bunch of case management positions. But unfortunately, um, as you could see from our earlier fun with finance conversation. Um, the dollars aren't necessarily always there to just add those things, you know, all at once. And so I, I think it's just going to take a close watch. And I, I definitely encourage you guys as the supervisors to really watch the caseload numbers closely and um, make sure that you're talking to the program directors if you're seeing these caseloads are getting really high um, because we definitely need to hear about it. I cannot stand, stand, sit and hear and say, um, okay, we're, everybody gets a case management position when the caseloads hit this number because we don't have the resources for that. But what I can say is it helps ELT and finance start to plan around what positions do we need and, you know, it helps us in our own decision making. Mm -hmm. 
Is there any um, discussion about access and assessment moving back to being at the local level so that they can be part of our team? Um, I look at the oversight of that and it would be a lot easier. Number one, like staff retention in that for them to feel like they're part of this team they're directly referring to. Mm -hmm. um, secondly, running into the um, like record request and how a person comes to the team, if it's how tightly knit it is or, um, I don't know, is there talk about them being part of our team instead of that remaining centralized where it's not feeling that way? Well, Emily, you're jumping a year yes. in advance. Oh, <laughs> no, <good>. honestly, <laughs> no, honestly, I mean, I, I think you all know that we're, um, we're reviewing the access process right now. Um, one of the things that I heard from the National Council who is consulting with us on this process um, is that a lot of teams have their assessment person right on the team, especially if they're a CCBHC. Because if you're a CCBHC, you don't screen anybody out. They all come to you. And I love that idea. I really do. Um, and you've got some people who are just really good at assessment and that's what they want to do. So, uh, but also when they do the assessment, the whole team gets the context. You know, it's not, um, they were assessed by somebody in Midland and now they're on this team. And you know, like you get that information much quicker and the person is less likely to have to reshare their story. So I hope that someday that might be an, an option. It's probably not gonna be in the first phase of this, but I do think that that's something that we need to consider. Julie, I had a question. I'm just trying to understand. Does this mean all consumers are placed on a team or do consumers have a choice to have just like a single service? So um, it, they could have, anybody will end up on a team. Um, however, they could choose like um, if, you know, if I'm a consumer and I really am only comfortable with Cindy as my case manager, you know, we, we can respect that. So um, they might be on, assigned to a team, but they don't necessarily have to see multiple people. And in teams, it doesn't always, it, it often actually doesn't work like that where everybody's seeing everybody. Act works a little bit more like that and you might see some of that, but we would still honor consumer choice around, I really only want to see this person. Right, and so, so this is the part that differs from ACT, you know, where ACT, they have to see everyone. And here it's not, it's more that the team is all responsible. So they're, you know, the consumer is having problems, all the team is responsible to share their wisdom. You know, sometimes if you're a person from the outside in a sense, you may see things a little bit more objective uh, and to be creative and offer suggestions. And if the, for example, the case holder is out ill and there's a crisis, somebody's gonna step in um, rather than everybody seeing everybody like an act. How many teams are you envisioning <clears throat> and how large are the teams going to be? Because I notice in some of our huddles in Midland sometimes, depending on the attendance, um, there can be varying degrees of participation just for like a time constraint and mm -hmm. as well as you know obviously zoom's a little bit different than meeting in a room together um but has there been thoughts into that like as far as yeah so there's that's something where we that's something that the team the subgroups um are going to have to determine and that's something that may look different county to county um and one of the things because i kind of rushed through the work plans um, I didn't get time to talk about is um, we need to do caseload alignment. So the, you know, the huddles were a step towards this, but it wasn't the end answer. So to make the huddles more, you know, useful for everybody, you really need to have caseload alignment amongst all of the people on the team. And that will make the huddle conversations more meaningful for everybody. So we're going to have to look at what resources we have, what consumers are out there. You know, we have already created a, like a data collect, a, a report, I guess I should call it, um, that shows where we have consumers in common. So we'll probably start there and look at like, who has most everybody um, in common with this prescriber, for example, or, or um, you know, however we break it out. And then 
um, we'll try to line them up starting with that. So I think the bigger counties will have more teams and the smaller counties will have fewer. Um, it's even possible that we could say that the small counties have one big team, depending on what makes the most sense. Um, and I did see a question just pop up about um, focus groups. Um, and the, so we did talk about a survey monkey and I'm not opposed to that. Um, I, the thing I don't like about survey monkey is that you don't get to have a conversation, um, but it may be that we offer both or something. So yeah, we can consider that. And then um, Mary, your question around the um, separate teams for children and adults. I would like that to, I, I think so, but I think what will end up happening is that there will be some people that are kind of on both teams. So we sort of have children's already set up in a way where they're already meeting with the prescriber, but we have some staff that see both kids and adults. And I don't know that I want to um, pull them out of having a, a dual population um, because it may not make the most sense. So we're kind of teasing that out, but I do see the children's teams kind of continuing as they are and this otherwise um, change happening for everybody else. Um, so Fori asked about um, a release of information for sharing information with the team. Um, they should not need that because we're all practicing together um, on the team. So since it'll be all employees. Right. Unless Jane has something to say about that. <laughs> well, you know, I do. Um, there is a lot that's going to have to change about our confidentiality and disclosure policy, especially be, I, I'm a little bit concerned about, and I think we can work around it, but we have to figure out how to address choice of provider. Um, the mental health code says that a recipient has the right to request a change in provider if they're, mm -hmm. you know, available or, or within reason. And we get a lot of that. And when you make up a team, I may like everybody on the team, but this one person, and I don't want them to have access to my life, my life information. And we're going to have to at least keep that in mind about going to have to have things in our policy and practice to address those concerns because they are um, required by the mental health code. So just when we start looking at that policy, especially, we're going to have to be very careful about that. Good question, Fori. I think there's, we, other, there's other questions in here too, and I want to bring us to a close. I, I appreciate the dialogue here, but we did promise noon. Um, and I see Fori has asked another uh, technical question about sequestered files, and there's a million questions, you know, to uh, respond to. Um, I just want to put it in the context of this as I, I close this out. Um, in 1996, person-centered planning and joint commission uh, were adopted by this agency, and that was two major uh, initiatives um, that spanned a few years. Um, in order to, you know, gear everybody up and change, you know, that's, that's part of change and it's part of us all right now. Um, you can't uh, really point out specifically what joint commission standards we are observing right now um, because they're embedded in everything we do. And so over time, um, as we adopt a better way a higher quality method of uh, operating and providing services, it becomes us. Um, in 97, we became managed care, and we've been managed care now for 23 years. And we've learned to live on a budget um, established by managed care, and other states are still wrestling uh, with the fee-for-service model. In 2001, we had a merger. We had multiple committees, just like Julie was saying. We've got to put together a number of different uh, committees. There were tons of committees that uh, were working on every aspect of uh, business to merge Midland Gladwin uh, with uh, Central Michigan to become a six-county entity. In 2011, we established Sigmo. We went from the most god-awful uh, piece of software to um, one of the most heralded uh, softwares by auditors who have come in, particularly Joint Commission comes in and they're just blown away um, when they do their audits. Um, 
And then we um, joined with four other CMHs to create Mid-State Health Network. Mid-State Health Network didn't happen on its own. Multiple committees um, spanning five CMHs and created this organization. And it took time and it changed things. It changes our culture. Each time we have a major shift, it changes culture. I'm just pulling all these forward to tell you that team-based care is on par with these other initiatives that we've done over the years with the promise of better service, better health, and lower costs uh, to our, uh, to our uh, consumers. So we need to make sure that um, we apply the same muster that we have uh, applied over the years to bring this agency forward. Arguments were made that this is the gold standard and we need to latch onto that, that others have already paved the path. Um, we have to find our own path, but there's others, many others who have already made mistakes that we don't have to repeat. And so we will engage consultants. Uh, we will do everything we can possible to minimize the amount of uh, stress and turmoil um, and disruption um, in the, uh, to the uh, end of making sure that we are providing everything uh, possible uh, to our community in support of its mental health. So I wanna thank everybody for your engagement today. Um, and I think it's been a nice, well-rounded uh, meeting. I'm wishing you all the best. Um, and I'm gonna close this out. Have a great day, buddy.